Um, so today is, as probably most of you will know, the Feast of St. Luke, the Evangelist. Uh, so fitting to be uh, studying a gospel tonight that Luke used uh, as one of his primary sources. So let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Gracious and loving God, as we ponder more deeply your word, we thank you for those evangelists that have handed on the good news to us. As we reflect upon this word of yours, may our faith flow and love deepen. And your beloved Son, Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. All right, so it only took us, what, five weeks to get into the first chapter of Mark. Um, so maybe tonight uh, we'll get beyond chapter one in the Gospel of Mark. Um, so uh, by way of a quick recap, uh, Mark begins his Gospel with a wonderful announcement, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that whole ancient sense of beginnings going back to Genesis, and probably Mark means by the good news, the good news about Jesus. And so this is his first uh, attempt uh, to narrate that good news for us. And the first great figure that we met, and I will add, I think that there are less than a dozen figures in the New Testament that are historically verifiable outside of the New Testament that appear in other ancient literature. John the Baptist is one of them. So uh, there are records about his uh, detention and death by Herod. So, um, so fascinating figure we saw last week on the edge of uh, the Promised Land, the Jordan River, uh, like one of the great prophets of old, announcing that something big is going to happen. One much greater than I is going to come. I'm not even fit to loosen the sandal straps. And uh, that great announcement uh, prepared the way for the first appearance of Jesus in the Gospel. And Mark says it very simply. It happened in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. First thing that we know about him in the Gospel of Mark. When coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open in the Old Testament. If the heavens are being opened up, they called it a theophany, a revelation of God. Something dramatic is taking place. A thing for a moment of Mount Sinai, when God appears in great glory and thunder. So the sky is being opened up. This is a sign of a divine revelation. And the Spirit, as a dove, and Mark uses the language, the spirit, we don't know if it was in the form of a dove, the bodily form of a dove, like the bird, or if the spirit swooping down as a dove would swoop down. So uh, later in the gospel tradition, one of the gospel writers will say, in bodily form, to clarify uh, what was meant there. And the voice from heaven, which in Mark's gospel, uh, seems to be directly addressed to Jesus, not to the crowd around him, unlike Matthew, who will make it a great public announcement. This is my son. But rather, you are my beloved son. With you, I'm well pleased. So, um, I want to pause for a moment. Uh, and I'll do this periodically in the Gospel uh, to invite you to imagine what it would have been like to be there at the Jordan River. Uh, when you go out to that part of the desert, it's hot and dry, it's barren, uh, and the river reminded me a lot actually of the Harpeth River, it's not very big. Uh, and in that hot, dry, dusty climate, this gaunt figure dressed in the prophet's attire, announcing something great is gonna happen. Sort of John, you might characterize him as fire and brimstone. Uh, there's an eschatological or an apocalyptic edge to John. And all the people, I mean, the Gospels probably exaggerated a bit, but John certainly was a known figure in Israel. A lot of people went out. So this is something, this is a big deal that everybody wants to be part of, to see what's going on. Not everybody who shows up, if you take the Gospel accounts with any degree of historicity, 
uh, are there to cheer John on, as you know. Some are down there to check out the crowds and make sure that they're behaving properly and so forth. But others really are drawn to the message. And so the submersion of Jesus in the water and coming up out of the water and the sky being open for him and the spirit as a dove descending and hearing the voice of the Father. Uh, when you do uh, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius or a directed retreat that is designed after those exercises, St. Ignatius in the 1500s really wanted those who did the exercises to meet Jesus uh, face to face. So with a gospel passage like this, he would encourage someone to read what the text had to say, and then he would invite the retreatant, those doing the exercises, to close their eyes and to imagine themselves being there. And he specifically invited them to use all of their senses. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell or touch? And what do you taste, if there's any tasting? So to really imagine, uh, as you're watching almost like a film, imagine the scene unfolding around you. Allow yourself to be one of the characters and allow yourself to be drawn into the gospel scene. So I encourage you, if you have never done that, as a way of praying with scripture, especially with gospel stories, to try praying that way. Read the text, close your eyes, and put yourself there. And ask how the Lord will speak to you when you do that. I've been invited on several of my direct retreats to do that precisely with this particular passage and others of the baptism. I'll just tell you briefly, one time, uh, I imagine myself standing there and I see Jesus in the water coming out. And then, of course, this doesn't happen in the gospel, but you know, when you're praying with your imagination, anything can happen. Uh, so Jesus turned and looked at me and he invited me to get into the water with him. And he baptized me. And there was a communion between the two of us that was profound. And I knew in my own particular way uh, that not by nature, we would say, but by, by being claimed, that I too was a beloved son of God, well pleasing to God. So when one begins to pray with these passages to encounter the living Christ, who is still with us, uh, remarkable things can happen. So uh, I encourage you to use that form of prayer sometimes when you're doing that. At once, the Spirit drove him out into the desert. And remember, the Jordan River there is in the desert, so he's not too far away. And he remained in the desert or the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was among wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. So uh, this is, uh, in the Gospel of John, by the way, which we'll come to later, there is no story of the temptation of Jesus. So uh, only found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew and Luke, although they know of Mark's story, also have an expanded version of the temptation of Jesus that most of us are very familiar with which has three parts. But there's something about the simplicity of Mark that is wonderful, don't you think? Just the simple, and it's in Luke, the Spirit leads Jesus out into the desert. In Mark's Gospel, it drives him into the desert. So isn't it interesting that Jesus, right after having this profoundly uh, close encounter, one might say, with the Father at the baptism, is now driven by the Spirit into the desert to be tested or tempted for 40 days. Now, if you're part of God's people, Israel, when you hear the word, or the words 40 days, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Part the Part Lent, okay, yeah, we Catholics, that's what we think. Uh, okay. <laughs> Ancient Israel, let's project back 2,000 years. Yeah, we do think of that. 40 years. Yes. Or, yeah, 40 years. So the number 40 is highly symbolic in the Old Testament throughout the history of God's people. The number 40 means a fullness of time. It was a long time. 
And so when God's people spend 40 years in the wilderness wandering before they're able to enter the promised land, that's two generations. Uh, and most of the people who began the journey don't complete the journey entering into the land of promise, as you all know from the narrative. So what's going on in this depiction of Jesus in Mark's Gospel for anyone who knows the Jewish tradition, the faith of Israel, the story of God's relationship with his people, Jesus is now reenacting the, the wilderness experience of God's people. And what happened to God's people in the wilderness over that 40 year history? Lots of things happened. They were sorely tested in the desert. And it's important to note that they failed the test. Over and over again, they grumbled. It was better to be back in Egypt than to be here. Uh, and so over and over again, you know, you gave us bread and water, but will you give us meat? And we're sick and tired of this man that you've given us from heaven and so forth. So uh, it's a time of grumbling, it's a time of testing, although for Jeremiah and some of the later prophets, centuries later, they look back at that time as a honeymoon, a golden era, when God really was close to the people, sustaining them every step of the way. And it was also a time when, as you know, that Israel met the Lord God in the uh, Mount Sinai in the most profound way in their history. And what did they receive in that profound encounter? We would, we would say the Word, the Torah, God's instructions on how to live life. We'll see it later in Matthew and Luke, but the first temptation of the enemy in Matthew and Luke is a temptation about bread, while Jesus is hungry. But if you command these stones to turn into bread, let's recreate the miracle of manna in the desert. And the response of Jesus in those Gospels, one does not live by bread alone. And what does one live by? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the sacred word of God that was entrusted to Israel in the desert. But here in Mark, we don't have any of that yet, do we? Uh, it's sparse in its description. You remain in the desert 40 days, tested or tempted by Satan, the adversary. Interesting verse, he was among wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Uh, it's interesting, what would an angels would signify divine help, God's assistance to Jesus in the tempting. What about those wild beasts? Well, they've been interpreted in a couple of different ways. One way that they've been interpreted is the danger of the desert, those dangerous wild beasts out there. And the early desert fathers certainly saw the wild beast here interpreted in that fashion. Uh, so when Anthony of Egypt and other great desert fathers went out into the desert to try to grow close to God, they began to wrestle with what they called the demons. So the wild beast would be the demons. And what were the demons? Things like anger, lust, uh, desire for riches, uh, ego, pride, uh, vainglory, all those destructive human things that we all struggle with. So the wild beasts in this, in their minds, would signify the threat, the danger uh, that was posed to Jesus in the desert. Another strain of interpretation regards this as a recreation of Genesis, that Adam was, a, was among the wild animals at the beginning of creation, uh, and the angels ministered to him during that time of testing. So it's an interesting set of possibilities. We didn't get out the other microphone tonight, did we? Uh, so, um, anybody have the key to get it for us? Okay. So, um, that way, if you guys want to read some, I'll let you do that. So, at, at the next little section, this is all still part of the very beginning. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God. So this is the good news about God that Jesus is proclaiming on the lips of Jesus. And what is that good news for Mark in a nutshell? It's all about the kingdom of God. This is the time of fulfillment. 
the kingdom or basileia can be the reign of God is at hand. And the word at hand implies it's like a train already coming into the station. It's on its way in to the station, as it were. So at hand implies an immediacy about it, an urgency. It's almost here. And the call of Jesus, like the call of the ancient prophets in the Old Testament, is to one of what in Greek is metanoia, uh, a change of mind. Uh, in the Old Testament, shuva, to turn around. So when you've been heading in the wrong direction away from God, it's time to turn around and go back to God. In the Greek New Testament, it's about changing one's mind and seeing anew. And believe in the gospel. Believe the good news. Oh, chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel, verses 14 and 15. So right at the beginning of the Gospel story. Chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Right, so, um, so there you have in a nutshell what the Gospel is going to be about. It's the proclamation of the Kingdom of God. And on the lips of Jesus throughout the Gospel, I think it appears 13 times. Very often associated with parables. So Mark is trying to give us at the very beginning of the Gospel what this is all about in a nutshell. The Kingdom is at hand, and so God is doing something great. Our response to it is to change our minds and to believe it. So it's an announcement of incredibly good news, and we're called to respond to that good news. It's a little different, I would add, in tone from the dire warnings of the Baptists in the desert, more positive in orientation. Okay, it's loud. The next section in the Gospel of Mark, which we're going to look at, uh, you can see it as sort of an inclusionary unit uh, from 16 to 39. And some scholars call it the first day in the ministry of Jesus. And by first day, Mark is going to give us a sort of typical first day of Jesus. Think more of this was a typical day in the life of Jesus in his public ministry. That's what Mark is really going to unfold for us. So let's start with 16 through 20. And passing by the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. And at once, abandoning their nets, they followed him. And continuing on a little ways from there, he saw James of Zebedee and his brother John, and they were mending their nets in a boat. And immediately he called them, and leaving behind their father Zebedee in the boat, with his hired hands, they followed him. Okay, so, uh, thank you. So quick, uh, and what translation was that? This is the, the Catholic Bible in the, in the, in the, the, so it's an electronic version of some form. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure what translation that is. Um, okay, quick note. Um, the very first activity of Jesus beyond pronouncing the gospel is to get followers. And he begins with four fishermen uh, who leave behind uh, their livelihoods. Uh, dramatic call scene. In ancient first century Judaism, uh, when there was a rabbi or a teacher, typically disciples would seek out the teacher. Uh, so the pattern of Jesus is different than the standard pattern. Instead of uh, them seeking Jesus out, Jesus takes the initiative, goes to the sea, and calls them. And the call involves leaving behind their profession uh, to do something bigger and better in the mind of Jesus associated with the kingdom. 
I want to say a quick word too about the, the so-called Sea of Galilee. Uh, when I was uh, when I was growing up, hearing uh, the Gospels proclaimed at Sunday Mass or reading them myself, you know, I pictured when Jesus is along walking along this so-called Sea of Galilee, I pictured um, an ocean and breaking waves like down in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, because that's where I had been to a sea. Uh, and in fact, it's a freshwater lake. So, and the first day that we arrived at the Sea of Galilee, the group of that did the pilgrimage, we came up over the hill and there was fog over the lake, so you couldn't see the whole thing. So we went to our hotel to check in, and you see this body of water in front of you. It's actually a freshwater lake, very clean water, lots of fish in it. Uh, it's very productive for fishing. And it had this immediate sense of mystery about it. But the next day we got up, uh, the fog had cleared, and you could see the entire Sea of Galilee right in front of you. So in one of the Gospels, it's called Lake Gennesaret, uh, or the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. All three of those are the same body of water. And it's a fresh body of water, and you can literally look around the entire shore. It takes some time to drive around to the opposite shore, which we did. We, we circled the entire Sea of Galilee over the course of the day, and uh, I'll also mention just very briefly, uh, we got to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. We had lunch at a place where you could order Peter's fish. <laughs> and the wind began to blow and the waves picked up and you could definitely get a sense of how quickly storms could come up on the Sea of Galilee. So, uh, but it's also uh, the area where Simon Peter's house is believed to exist is in Capernaum, which is on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. Someone could well imagine that he's right there in Capernaum and uh, Peter and the other fishermen were nearby fishing. Uh, and we'll see that, in fact, the next scene takes place in the synagogue in Capernaum. And they entered into Capernaum, and entering into the synagogue promptly on the Sabbath, he taught them. And they were astonished over his doctrine, for he was teaching them as one who has authority, and not like the scribes. And in their synagogue there was a man who was who I'm sorry, there was a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What are we to you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus admonished him, saying, Be silent and depart from the man. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice departed from the man. And they were all so amazed that they inquired among themselves, saying, What is this? And what is the, this new doctrine? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And his fame went out quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. And okay, so, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I want to say a bit about this first uh, day in the life of Jesus. So how did Jesus spend his time uh, teaching, preaching? Uh, the ministry we would call it today, the ministry of the Word, was at the heart of what Jesus did. And the remarkable thing about the Word of Jesus is the Word that Jesus proclaims, and it's interesting, Mark does not give us here uh, the actual sermon of Jesus. And Luke's Gospel, when he uh, gives his first sermon in a synagogue, Luke will give us a summary of a sermon based on the prophet Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. But Mark gives us no summary. For Mark, it's almost not the content that matters. It's more the power with which Jesus speaks. There's something about this word that is different. He's not speaking like the typical expert of the law, the scribes or the theologians of the day. Um, so the scribes would often be interpreting the law, how do we apply it to our life. Jesus is more like the prophets of old when they say, thus says the Lord God. Boom. You know, they speak with the authority of God uh, on their lips. So the great dawning of the kingdom begins with proclamation of the word in the synagogue. Quick note about synagogues. Synagogues were local gathering places for the Jewish community and uh, Capernaum was quite a lot larger than Nazareth. If Nazareth had a few hundred people in it, Capernaum probably had a couple of thousand. 
uh, of residents. So a bigger town on the north side, there was a, uh, a Roman centurion station there, a tax customs post, and it was a bit of a crossroads with people going north and south, east and west. So it was a, a more happening kind of place. Instead of Lawrenceburg, think of Columbia or something. <laughs> Using local Tennessee geography uh, by thinking about Capernaum. And the first encounter in the synagogue is with a man who uh, is possessed by an unclean spirit. Uh, and here we see really that first confrontation with that which opposes the dawning of God's reign. And it's interesting, you know that the man says, what have you to do with us, not with me? And uh, some scholars uh, say perhaps this demon now, this unclean spirit, is speaking on behalf of the whole world of darkness. So that he is the representative spokesperson who's gonna first address the Holy One of God. Uh, so the, you could say I'm putting it in stark terms, but the battle has, been, has begun. And uh, note that the exercise of exorcism in the gospel is by the power of word. So it is by the word of Jesus, the Holy One of God, that the unclean spirit is driven out of the man. And note the words, quiet, come out of him. Jesus will use a very similar command uh, we'll see later in the gospel when he meets the storm at sea. Quiet, be still. It's almost as if he will be exercising the storm. So in the gospel of Mark uh, and in the ancient world, that which was opposed to the reign of God uh, might be clumped under categories uh, in opposition to Jesus. What needs to be defeated? Uh, sickness. Uh, is a sign either that one has committed in the ancient world some personal sin, or in the ancient world it was also thought you could be afflicted by the sin of your ancestors. And we may, on one hand, think that that's sort of odd, right? You, you hear that in the Old Testament. You know, the wickedness will be handed down from the fathers to their children, uh, but the mercy of God to the thousandth generation. You always have the good news, even in the Old Testament. But, you know, in some ways, the ancients were pretty insightful about what happened to human beings. So when people head down a destructive path, the sins of the fathers do shape the children, don't they? Think about how people, in their brokenness, wound their children, and the children repeat the sins of the fathers. So, so uh, in the ancient world, if you were sick, ordinarily, uh, they connected that with the source of evil that had afflicted you or some sin that you had committed. And we'll actually meet in the Gospel a couple of very important moments. A man born blind in the Gospel of John. And the question will be, whose sin was it that caused the blindness? Was it the sin of this man or the sin of his father? And Jesus' reply there is, it's not about sin. So he unhooks that notion. There's also another passage in the Gospel of Luke where um, he will say, you know, the blood that was spilt, uh, or when the tower fell, and those people were no worse than anyone else. But if any was on the one, but worse will happen to you unless you repent. So, so that notion of that the evil that happens to us is caused by some human sin on our part was very common in the ancient world, and Jesus specifically addresses it on a couple of occasions. And we might think that that's a primitive notion, but how many of us when we get sick and we're feeling really bad, at some moment feel, what have I done, you know, to bring this on myself? Um, the modern variation is, well, you're too stressed out. You've been stressing yourself too much, so you've made yourself sick. And you hear that sometimes, people tell you that. Which there could be some truth to that sometimes, too, so. Um, so the problems are possession by the, the underworld, the spirits of the unclean spirits, uh, and the sins that cripple humanity. And we will see Jesus healing sickness, we will see him exorcising demons, and we will also see him forgiving sins. So he begins to exorcise what will be astounding, what normally only God can do. 
And that's all that will begin to raise the question in the gospel. Who does this man think he is? Uh, what's the reaction on the part of the people in the synagogue in Capernaum? All were amazed. And his fame begins to spread throughout the whole region of Galilee. So this is the first beginnings. Let's continue on from 29 to 34. And soon after departing from the synagogue, they went into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But the mother-in-law of Simon lay ill with a fever, and at once they told him about her. And drawing near to her, he raised her up, taking her by the hand, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered to and she ministered to them. Then when evening arrived after the sun had set, they brought to him all who had maladies and those who had demons. And the entire city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were troubled with various illnesses, and he cast out many demons. But he would not permit them to speak because they knew him. All right, so um, and we can also pass the Michael for fun along too. We'll get different voices and different translations of the Bible too. Um, so a quick note here. Uh, I always find this little footnote. He's just done his day's work in the synagogue of Capernaum teaching and exercising a demon, and he arrives at the house and he has to continue his work. So, so it's like being a doctor or a priest, you're always on call. And uh, so we see the first healing of Jesus. So the first exorcism in the first day, the first healing is the mother-in-law of Simon. So a quick note, because we Catholics have a celibate clergy, we often don't think about Peter being married and having a mother-in-law. Probably most of the 12 were married. So well, that was very, that was the normal situation in Israel. So we actually meet the mother-in-law of Simon there who is sick with a fever. And uh, Jesus uh, heals her. And interestingly, immediately after she is healed, she begins to serve. So there's something about one could tie it in when we experience the healing of God that naturally leads us to begin to serve. You know, it's an outflowing of love and response. Um, picture, if you can, for a moment, a little neighborhood uh, with condominiums all around you and narrow streets. And all the condominiums are hooked together by common walls. So that's the way uh, the ruins of Capernaum look. So when you're walking those little streets around the area of the synagogue, uh, all the buildings are connected together by common walls. You can almost picture Jesus standing in the doorway as after sunset as it's growing dark. And now the whole village is gathered outside the door. And you see the principal elements of healing and also of exorcisms. Now sometimes, just a quick note on exorcisms, you know, some of the exorcisms in the gospel clearly look like what we would call, for example, an epileptic. So sometimes ancient psychiatric or psychological or even physiological illnesses appear to the ancients as possession. And I will say the first time I saw someone having a seizure uh, when I was a young person, uh, it looks frightening. It looks like they're demon-possessed. So one can easily see, too, in the ancient world how easy it would have been to attribute many things to demons in a way that we probably wouldn't do in the modern world uh, as readily. Well. Also, a quick note about the, the importance of which I already mentioned of knowing names. Remember what I talked about? If you know the name of a student in a class, you've got better control over them. So to know the name is to control the... No, I talked to the RCA about that. To know the name is to be able to control the encounter. So remember when Adam in uh, Genesis, the Lord God brings to him all the animals, and Adam gives names to them. It shows that he has some type of authority over them, just like in a classroom when I'm teaching, and I know the students when I was in high school, I could say, Pete, sit back down, and he'd listen because I knew his name. If I was a substitute teacher and I didn't know the name, I, 
I would be lost and they knew it because you didn't know their name, you didn't have as much control over the class and they knew it. So in the ancient world, they believed that if you knew the name of something, you had some power over it. And so when Moses meets the Lord God for the first time uh, at the Mount Horeb, uh, he says, what is your name? He wants to control the encounter. And the response of the Lord is, I am who I am. Uh, and which can also be interpreted in the future tense. I will be who I will be. In other words, Moses, you're not going to control this encounter. So God remains sovereign even in revealing his name. And you notice with Jesus, um, the demons are trying to control him. We know who you are. We know your name. You're the Holy One of God. But in this case, their knowledge has no effect. They have no power over him. And the same is true. You see that little note. He does not permit them to speak because they know him. So he will not allow them to gain control of the encounter. Let's go to 35 to 39. Rising very early before dawn, he left and went off to a deserted place where he prayed. Simon and those who were with him pursued him, and then finding him said, Everyone is looking for you. He told them, Let us go on to the nearby villages, that I may preach there also. For this purpose have I come. So he went into their synagogues, preaching and driving out demons throughout the whole of Galilee. All right, so here you have in Mark's Gospel a snapshot of the day, of a typical day in the life of Jesus. And so what did we learn from this quick overview of day one? We learn that Jesus gets up very early in the morning. He goes off by himself to a deserted place to pray, to be alone with the one who later in the gospel tradition he will speak of as Abba, uh, dear Father. And so this quiet time alone early in the morning begins his day. His day is spent proclaiming the gospel, the good news, uh, going into the synagogues, healing the sick, and exorcising demons. So that was, in a nutshell, the ministry of Jesus. And it's clearly, according to Mark, going to be what we would call an itinerant ministry. He's not going to set up shop in one place, but he's going to go from village to village, to different synagogues, as a missionary, as it were, spreading this good news. So that's the purpose, Mark tells us right here in chapter 1, for which he was sent, to preach the good news. The next little section uh, is not part of the same day. It's a new day, as it were. And it's an isol one of these isolated stories in the Gospel of Mark that could almost be plugged in anywhere. Where I talked about how Mark has these stories that have come down to him in the tradition like pearls. And it's a self-contained story that could be relocated if Mark had wished to put it somewhere else. But this is where we meet the first uh, pearl, as it were, along the way. Someone want to read that for us. 40 through 45. A leper approached him with a request, kneeling down as he addressed him. If you will to do so, you can cure me. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I do will it be cured. The leprosy left him then and there, and he was cured. Jesus gave him a stern warning and sent him on his way. Not a word to anyone now, he said. Go off and present yourself to the priest and offer for your cure what Moses prescribed. That should be a proof for them. Go on. Two more verses. Okay. Okay. One more verse. The man went off and began to proclaim the whole matter freely making the story public. As a result of this, it was no longer possible for Jesus to enter a town openly. He stayed in desert places, yet people kept coming to him from all sides. All right, so we meet here the, the first little taste of what we call the messianic secret in the Gospel of Mark. Don't tell anybody about this. 
and the man didn't obey him. In fact, he, he couldn't stop telling everybody what happened. And so as a result, Jesus began to have to go out to deserted places to, to try to get away from the crowds. But people began to seek him out. Imagine the great power of healings. Uh, people were drawn to him. I sometimes say like, like moths to a light on a summer night. You know, something about Jesus and the healing effect that drew people to him. So powerful healing narratives. So as many narratives in uh, the gospel tradition, uh, this is the first kind of extended healing that's described in detail in the Gospel of Mark. And with leprosy, a few quick notes. Leprosy might not be specifically the disease that we call leprosy. It could have been any one of a number of skin conditions that made a person unclean ritually. And they had some awareness that this could be spread from person to person. And for the safety of the community, lepers could no longer remain in contact with the rest of the community. They were required to live, to live outside of the villages and cities. And they were also required to warn people at a distance that they were unclean, so that people would not inadvertently draw near and touch them. Well, with and, and Carville, how recently ago was that? So before antibiotics in the 20th century, before they had a treatment. And of course, uh, St. Uh, Damien, uh, who went to Hawaii and ministered to the lepers and eventually caught leprosy and died from it. Um, so in the ancient world, of course, there were no, although sometimes people, were, their skin condition cleared up, and the priest had to examine the person to see if they could be readmitted to the community. So they were kind of, in that sense, primitive doctors that would examine the person to see if they were clean enough to return to human community. So uh, in the ancient world then, can you imagine, not only were you afflicted with a terrible illness, but now you are separated from everybody that you love, the whole human community. So the isolation of leprosy and only being with other lepers was terrible. And not only that, because you were unclean, you couldn't worship God any longer because you couldn't go to the temple in an unclean state. And so, and it was believed that you had done something again to cause the leprosy, some form of sin. So imagine that triple effect. You're not at home with yourself because of the illness, you're out of community with others, and you're also now apart from God. It would have been probably one of the most desperate conditions that one could imagine being in in the ancient world. And uh, even, you know, as you were pointing out recently in, your, in human history, when something like that happened, also think about uh, Ebola when it began to spread, the fear that it created, uh, and, the, and the touching, the fear of touching and all that. Uh, when AIDS began, before they understood how it could be uh, contracted, the fear of being around a person with AIDS and so forth. So that ancient primeval fear of being made unclean by the other. Note what Jesus does in this healing. If you wish or will, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion or pity or mercy. The Greek word is a gut-wrenching experience of concern for another. Your insides are turning. Did things start getting out of hand? Um, you know, my closest, closest experience to this was when we went to Haiti on the medical mission trip. And 
you know, we were different, you know, because we had white skin in, in the countryside. And all the children wanted to come up and touch our skin. So we couldn't leave the parish compound without multitudes of people being attracted to us and wanting to be close. And the kids especially wanting to touch the white skin to see what it felt like. And I remember one evening we were going to give out balls or something. And we began to throw a ball out and hordes of children overwhelmed us trying to get to the ball. So maybe as Jesus began to experience, I'm just postulating now, as he began to experience this effect, maybe he began to realize um, one has to be somewhat, that's, I'm purely speculating, or I have no clue about why that happened. So, um, but note, Jesus does not hesitate to touch the unclean person. This is a profound moment. So he immediately breaks through all those barriers of isolation that that man had been living with by the human contact of Jesus who is willing to touch him. Uh, a whole gospel could be written on that bad money alone. He does not keep himself distant from the unclean, uh, but goes right to the source and touches it. So the healing that this man experienced was not only a physical healing, but undoubtedly connected him to the human community again, and also to God in a whole new way. So a very profound moment. I do will it be made clean. Yes, correct. And you also have to go to the synagogue or wherever. And be ritually purified. Be somehow ritually purified. Jesus touches people, unclean people, the gospel, or the lady with the flow of blood touches him. And you never hear that he had to go. Jesus, remember, he gets crucified for some reason. One of the things that Jesus is doing is he's breaking these ritual barriers, these taboos. But, but the scribes and Pharisees who accuse him of so many other things never. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? Never. But they don't accuse him. He's unclean. He didn't purify himself. Although you see hints of it when they say he doesn't purify his hands or his disciples don't before he eats. Why are you eating in an unclean way? So you do see hints of it. But indeed, I mean, ordinarily, if you touch someone who is unclean, then you also became unclean. If you touch the dead body, if you touch the bodily fluid, there's a whole set of rituals of purification you have to go through to be purified if you do that in the Old Testament. The very first thing, Jesus Well, yeah, that's your, of course, that's our perspective as 20th century people believe in Jesus as God, but that wouldn't have uh, uh, qualified for the Pharisees and scribes who are saying, why is he not doing what he's supposed to be doing? Right. So it's, I would say instead of proving, he's unfolding the mystery of the identity of Jesus in the narrative is the way I would describe it. So again, we're invited as hearers of the gospel to begin to identify with the people in the gospel who are saying, who is this who has power over unclean spirits? Who can speak with this kind of authority? So we're actually as hearers being invited to, in a sense, answer the question too for ourselves. I would, yeah, that's a great theological perception. 
In other words, that when he touches, he's not made unclean, rather he makes clean what he touches. Yes, and that's precisely sort of what's unfolding in the gospel. Alright, so we, we've gotten through chapter 1, if you noticed. Yes. After 5, 6, 8 weeks, yes. Well, what was the offering that here in Leper was supposed to be given to the priest of the Lord and Moses? It's mentioned there, it did the offering as Moses described. I would have to research what the offering was. It's spelled out in the Old Testament. So there are sections that say, this is the type of sacrifice that you have to offer if this is the case. So if you read Leviticus, for example, it'll tell you all different ways you can become unclean, and it will specify when you become unclean, what you must do to rectify the situation, what kind of offerings. And sometimes those offerings vary based on your ability to buy. So if you have more resources, you have to, you're required to have a more expensive offering. If you're poorer, then this can also substitute. So I don't know off the top of my head what that offering is for leprosy in this case. Yeah, so the ordinary people don't seem to be uh, paying attention to what the demons are saying about Jesus. Um, and remember, too, that the Gospels are written 40 years later, again, with resurrection glasses. So the hindsight is clear. Uh, as things unfold, it's not always quite so clear. Uh, so there was certainly something about Jesus to his peers that was very ambiguous, uh, open to interpretation or misinterpretation on the part of the people who witnessed what he was doing. And later on, we'll actually hear some claims about that. Well, if he has power over demons, that must mean that he's possessed by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, is the accusation that's thrown out at him. How can he control these demons? Well, he must be possessed. this story about the leper is a very powerful one to pray with as St. Ignatius invited us to pray with. If I can imagine myself as this person crying out to Jesus for help in some point of my own need, I put myself in the story and see Jesus reaching out to touch me in any one of the miracle stories in the Gospels, it can indeed have a profound effect. Because all of us are afflicted in various ways. Um, so I'll add, you know, uh, because we don't live in a world where we assume everything is demonic, and even though the Roman Catholic Church does believe in the possibility that a person can be possessed by demons, and we have professionally trained exorcists in the church, uh, they study carefully cases that are referred to them, and those who do it say the actual percentage of people who are truly possessed is very small compared to the total number of people that they examine. And my understanding is they look for uh, extraordinary things, superhuman power, knowledge of things that a person could not have knowledge of, the ability to speak ancient languages that they've never 
your study and so forth. So some evidence of that is, and I always clarify first to make sure it's not a psychological issue or a medical problem of some kind. But I will also add, all of us can be afflicted by various things in life. We might be afflicted by uh, the demon, the, the, the Desert Fathers I think had it right, when they classified them by seven major things. We could be afflicted by anger or wrath, by pride, by lust, by jealousy, by gluttony, etc., etc. So we can be variously afflicted in the human condition, uh, fear. Uh, and so what can set us free from these afflictions that are sometimes greater than our power to heal ourselves? So I do think you're right on target in terms of mentioning this is a great kind of gospel passage to imagine oneself in. And often you do that on these retreats. Legion. Because he tells Jesus, leave me alone. I want to be like this. And how many times have I said on my long journey with Jesus, look, I'm in a comfortable place with me alone. I don't want to go out and serve and, and preach and do it anymore. Just leave me be for a while. So I can relate to that. Yeah, we will come in Mark's gospel to that story. Mark describes the position of the man by legion in the most this one in detail of any of the Gospels. It's pretty dramatic. Uh, it's probably one of the archetypal encounters. How many of y'all, by the way, saw that film, The Exorcist, in the 1970s? <laughs> you know, that terrified me. I never wanted to, never wanted to see a film like that again. I saw it when I was in college, actually. Yeah, a quick, yeah, a quick reminder too that uh, in the first century, in the Jewish part of the gospel, the peanut butter part, um, they had a whole system of ritual and cleanness and purification. If you read the book of Leviticus, all kinds of things could make you unclean. And some of them were such grave offenses that you would be stoned to death if you became unclean in that way, versus other ways that could be rectified. So yeah, uncleanness in the ancient world is a broad category. It's something that is separating you from God and human community and the quote unquote ordinary state. We could also sort of see the food laws of Israel the same way. Certain animals are clean and there are others that are unclean. And usually the unclean animals are different in some way. So there's a classification system where ordinary normal things are safe, but that which is uh, abnormal is unclean and dangerous to the human condition. The leprosy is Leviticus 13 and 14. There are two chapters in Leviticus, chapters 13 and 14, if you want to read about the ancient prescriptions. All right, we have now arrived almost at 8 o'clock, so we're not going to jump into chapter 2. The only thing I want to note as we move forward is uh, while it may be true that uh, so far, we have Jesus exercising his power, his ministry. Uh, we can say with the world of darkness as the kingdom of God is dawning. Uh, he's going to very quickly encounter his first human opposition already in chapter 2. So it's not going to take long before the human actors in the world begin to resist him. And we'll see that right away in chapter 2. You all have a wonderful week. Shall we close with the glory be? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall.